tracking on radar. Um, we'll look at different elements of weather from summertime severe weather to flooding and even wintertime events, which can be severe, um, have severe impact. And then the reporting guidelines, and then last but not least, the sign up, which I already mentioned at the end of all this, later on tonight or tomorrow, you'll receive a registration uh, email from John Bangoff, one of our newer forecasters. So it, to begin, the National Weather Service is part of the federal government. Our parent agency is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And both agencies, Weather Service and NOAA, fall under the Department of Commerce. Uh, the Weather Bureau was originally formed to protect the nation's economy and agriculture, um, as well as weather safety. And uh, we now, uh, our mission is primarily protection of life and property, uh, agriculture and other things like that have been privatized. Uh, we have private weather services to, to do the, the agricultural forecast. But we issue life uh, and property saving uh, forecasts and warnings, and that's our primary mission. Now, the large umbrella of the Weather Service uh, incorporates uh, nine national centers, which focus on, on specific areas, aviation, climate. The modeling center uh, is the expertise that produces all of our computer model forecasts. Uh, NCEP central operations, uh, that's where the, the data goes through. There's oodles of data. It's like a fire hose that is only getting larger in time. National Hurricane Center, which you've heard of, obviously the Storm Prediction Center that you've heard of, Space Weather Prediction Center, a little lesser known, and the Weather Prediction Center, which uh, is down in, uh, in, in Maryland, that uh, previously was, was NCEP and before that NMC, actually when I worked there, it was called NMC a couple acronyms ago. Um, but the field structure of the Weather Service is where the rubber beats the road. This is where we interact with our customers the local offices. There are 122 local offices. Five uh, offices cover parts of Pennsylvania. Um, you'll see in a minute on the map. And there are river forecast centers that, that deal with the weather, the water after it's hit the ground and, and forecasting stream flows. Um, there are 13 of those across the country. Six regional offices to kind of handle administratively and uh, uh, in each region, because each region of the United States has different uh, weather needs. Um, we certainly here in central PA are not uh, hit by hurricanes as often as Florida. Um, so each region has has a different uh, flavor to to cover the the range of weather events that are more prominent in their area. And then headquarters is in Silver Spring, Maryland. Here's a look at all the local uh, weather service offices. You can see State College covers most of central PA, and I mentioned the other offices that cover parts of Pennsylvania. Binghamton's area covers uh, northeast, the Poconos. Uh, Philadelphia Mount Holly covers the southeast, um, let's say about eighth of Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh covers a large part of western and western, west central PA, and then Cleveland has a couple counties in the far northwest uh, where lake effect uh, snow is prominent. And here's just a little closer to home, showing the county maps and um, the shading. A little hard to see the, the difference between Binghamton's area and Mount Holly, but it roughly is uh, between Carbon and Moreau and these other ones further north. That's where the, the separation is there. And little stars for where these offices are located. Um, let's see, Cleveland is a little off this map, and so is Binghamton. So look at, at each office. Um, they kind of call this the cookie cutter approach, so like each office, when all of this was decided in the modernization in the 90s, each office would have um, five lead forecasters, five general forecasters, and then administrative forecasters, a meteorologist in charge, there's a science officer, warning coordination meteorologist, um, and a service hydrologist for a total of 14 people. Uh, and then electronic technicians to make sure that all the equipment both in the office and remotely is working. We have a lot of gauges and uh, NOAA weather radio transmitters and the radar site, which is 10, 10 miles away from our office needs, needs maintenance. Um, and then I mentioned uh, some of the other specialists, but we do have a hydrologist who's a meteorologist a lot of times, um, an observational specialist, the research and training is covered by the science officer, 
outreach. Um, we are fortunate to have a computer person in, in each office that is necessary with all the software and um, and it becomes important to have somebody who can do that uh, locally, and then an administrative assistant who helps us with all of the all of the uh, issues, getting paid and uh, materials that we need. And we're open 24/7, 365. So uh, anytime, day or night, um, there's somebody there. How we typically work uh, in general: there's a short-term desk, a long-term desk. The duties on those uh, short-term covers the near-term public, um, any any active weather now, uh, aviation forecast, we, we forecast for terminal sites, air terminals across Pennsylvania. Um, the longer term desk uh, will handle looking at days three to seven, uh, looking at updates there. Um, and oftentimes are, are brought into the near term when it gets busy or you know can help out with any number of things, social media wise or uh, administratively. And the public service desk typically is the one that deals with social media and phone calls and gathering storm reports. Um, it's really a catch-all position because they they can have a radar going on their on their workstation and issue a warning, but then also um, gather the reports and send those out. So it's a really dynamic and and necessary, really important position uh, in operations. But that's just the base. Uh, we have three. When the weather ramps up, um, our weather a workload goes up exponentially and we it's not unusual to have two or three extra forecasters uh, a storm coordinator to make sure that if we have storms throughout all of central pennsylvania that certain people are sectorizing looking in the northeast for severe weather there maybe the southeast there's a flash flood risk maybe across the west it's straight line wind damage so you can sectorize and those people are always communicating but it gets very busy and to have somebody kind of overseeing the operations when you have a big outbreak um, you've es essentially doubled or tripled your workload in a very short amount of time and uh, we're using all this equipment i mentioned the fire hose of data um, pretty much satellite radar is constant uh, there's not always uh, reflectivity coming back on the radar uh, but even in clear air we can see bugs and insects and boundaries things like that so there's there's always data coming in whether or not the weather is actually active but it takes uh, some pretty high powered computers to crunch that data um, and we have remote sensing equipment that's outside the office for the automated surface observing um, observations that come from airports so we have a lot of equipment a lot of computers that's no no question that our skill over the last 30 years is uh, directly tied to the amount of computational power that we can harness. So just a, uh, a background of the Skywarn. Um, with all this technology, you may be thinking, well, why why do we need people? Um, well, the answer is, you know, we don't have robots that can pick up the largest hailstone and measure it and then call us up and let us know. We We need ground truth to either verify or disprove what we think may be falling out of that particular storm cloud. Um, so for years, we've been training observers to report hazardous weather. Oftentimes these are hobbyists. Um, some people are, are their uh, co-op observers, um, but largely it's just people who are really in touch with the weather. They wanna help out. Um, maybe they have kept a rain gauge in their in their yard for years and they do that every day, but they want to do more. Um, so we've maintained the Skywarn uh, volunteer network to give us the ground truth we need. And that helps us improve um, and refocus our efforts in the future for certain types of events uh, in certain places. Um, population wise across our area, uh, you know, we have a big discrepancy between the Southeast, which is really, you know, Harrisburg, the capital, Lancaster County, exploding populations down there. And then some of the mountainous areas to the North where it's it's hard to get people. Um, kind of wish some of the goats or the elk could talk and give us weather reports, but they don't. Um, so we need people in the places uh, where the weather happens and, and that, tells us how how we're doing and that adds, adds credibility to our products and services and truly uh, spotters are the eyes and ears of the field um, it's it's the last 
part of the equation, but it's the most important one because if we don't know what's actually happening, all of this, uh, all the computers in the world aren't going to, aren't going to give us the information we need. So we actually in State College have over 3,000 trained spotters. Uh, we don't always hear from them. Um, we tend to solicit information from spotters when the weather is active. And there are a number of different ways we can get that information from people. Nationally, there are over 300,000 trained spotters. Um, and uh, just in case you're curious, if you uh, get your training from our office today, or maybe you already had some training from another office, it's portable. So you can uh, say if you move south to outside of DC in the next couple of years and you want to still be a storm spotter, you have your card, you're you're good to go. You just contact the new local office, they can get you in their database and transfer the credentials there. So uh, as I mentioned, today's class are going to focus on aspects of observing weather and knowing which, which uh, weather reports to forward to us and accurate reporting of those observations because some, some weather types may mimic others. Uh, for instance, uh, low-hanging scud during scud clouds during heavy rain oftentimes get reported to us as wall clouds or tornadoes. But we'll we'll take a look at what to look at in those situations. And when the course is complete and you register at the end, you will be a certified member of our team, a very valuable part of, of what we do to keep uh, the public and our partners in the emergency management community safe. So just some quick background uh, in case you didn't know. Uh, there's kind of a three-tiered approach to to how we issue our forecasts and warnings. In general, uh, from from afar, as far as days out, we issue outlooks when um, a certain weather type is perhaps possible several days out. When you get closer, um, we tend to issue watches when we have at least 50% confidence that there's going to be certain criteria met, and that. That's especially for winter storms. Quantitatively, if we expect uh, four to six inches of snow, there may be a watch if we have 50% or greater confidence for that. And then once we get within 24 to 36 hours and our confidence is up to about 80% on that happening, we can we can issue warnings. Or if we won't quite reach warning criteria, there'll be advisories. But it's, it's all based on confidence. Um, and that's increasingly we use probabilistic models for that, uh, which give us a range of solutions, not, not to get too much into it, but it's not just about, well, I'm, I'm feeling a little insecure today as a forecaster, so I, I don't think I'm gonna do that. It's, it's based in science, it's based on models and, and interpretation of the models. So basically an outlook several days in advance is something possible. It's up to a 50% chance of occurrence, uh, just less than 50%. And then a watch, conditions are beginning to be favorable for a particular event. Um, still not a certainty, but when you've exceeded that 50% confidence, um, a watch is certainly in the realm of possibility to be issued. And then a warning means uh, the event is imminent or even occurring right now. And it, it, it doesn't mean it's not binary, but it, it means that we're as confident as we can possibly be um, to, to uh, receive that particular weather. And for severe weather, um, that means it's imminent or about to happen and take cover. So just a quick look at uh, Outlook. We issue a hazardous weather outlook every day um, and the Storm Prediction Center issues various outlooks for various uh, uh, severe weather. Some are, are more detailed with percentage chances of, of specific weather types like damaging winds or tornadoes. Our text product here in the office generally says, okay, is there a possibility for an advisory or greater, then we will we'll mention that particular threat. If we don't see ourselves issuing an advisory, we will say the probability for widespread hazardous weather is low. Whoops, I want to go back. So uh, severe weather outlooks, again, uh, SPC issues these. These have been expanded to five categories, um, from general thunder to marginal, the darker green, to slight um, to an enhanced risk, moderate, and then high. Uh, so that's an expansion. It used to just be um, general thunder, slight, and uh, moderate, and high. So uh, moving on, uh, a watch. Uh, it gets produced both graphically and text-wise, both for severe weather and for winter storms and blizzards. 
uh, and ice as well. We also issue high uh, high heat watches uh, in the summertime as well for, especially for when it gets humid, the body can't, uh, you know, once you sweat, you, it becomes really inefficient because uh, essentially you can't evaporate that moisture from your skin. It's the evaporative cooling that helps your body cool down. And when you have heat indices that essentially make it feel like your body temperature, you're really not gonna be cooling down. So that's that's what those are issued for. And again, when um, when we issue warnings, um, it's when it's an 80% or greater confidence ranging from winter storms, blizzards, heat, floods, severe, and tornado. And when we talk about severe summertime weather, uh, what exactly are we looking for? Well, we've established 58 miles per hour or greater as a benchmark for uh, a measured wind gust that is severe. We certainly can get some damage from lesser wind gusts. You can get tree branches down, maybe some weaker trees falling, but generally 58 miles per hour or more starts to produce significant structural damage. Uh, also hail, one inch, or one inch in diameter or greater, and tornadoes are, are classified as severe, obviously. What is not severe? Frequent lightning, even though um, any thunderstorm can produce damaging lightning, we're not issuing thunderstorms for lightning. Um, but it, it, it's obviously a big focus and big stress of our summertime uh, safety campaign that lightning injuries and deaths uh, need to be taken very seriously. Um, we're primarily issuing warnings for wind damage uh, and hail damage, but any thunderstorm can produce a deadly lightning bolt. Um, and just an accumulation of pea-sized hail is also not considered severe. It can be uh, unusual, and uh, I've actually seen you know pea-sized hail have to be plowed from streets, but uh, essentially it's not going to be producing damage, structural damage or denting of cars in most cases. Um, it, it could produce uh, damage to crops if you've got that much pea-sized hail, but essentially an accumulation of small hail is not severe. And then sub-severe storms. We're, we're always looking uh, for higher impact situations and uh, we will issue special weather statements when a storm stays, starts to pulse up. We don't think it's producing large hail or damaging wind yet but it may be on its way towards that. Um, certainly when people are outside, they need to know if there's gonna be a 35 to 55 mile an hour gust or some sub-severe hail. Um, they don't set off EAS, tone alerts, or uh, most phone apps, but essentially we issue special weather statements um, when we think that a storm is either increasing in intensity or, or can be more of a, a nuisance. Um, but not really a threat to life and property, just something that people would wanna take cover from, uh, but won't be producing damage. <clears throat> and again, a note for winter time, um, uh, conditions not meeting the winter storm criteria we issue advisories for. So it's very analogous, severe weather warnings in summer, a special weather statement, winter storm warnings advisories in the winter time. It's really just the scope of impact that we're trying to delineate there. And here's a video um, of of a thunderstorm. There's there is no uh, audio on this, but you can see that the winds start to increase, and you may see some small branches start to fall. Um, at least initially, it it would appear that this might be just kind of special weather statement category. Um, but you can see things are getting a little more serious now. We've got some small branches, a couple larger branches, um, trees starting to sway. It's really once you get some large branches starting to come down that um, we would want to have a warning out for those because those are those are situations that that can injure or or kill people when larger branches or or the trees themselves are are coming down. And of course, if this particular storm was training over the same area and we had um, a gauge or precipitation estimates that suggested, uh, flash flood guidance values would be reached, we, we could also issue uh, either flood advisories or flash flood warnings. We tend to call flood advisories puddle advisories. 
you know, we still don't want people to drive into it if you've got some intersections that are flooded. That that branch right there says to me that's a severe storm because that's that's a huge branch. The other ones before were not, but at this point, uh, if it's strong enough to bring that branch down, it's probably bringing down some other larger branches in the area as well. But for the most part, you can see this storm was, uh, all these trees remained intact. So if not for that larger branch, that might just be special weather statement category. So taking a look at the types of wind damage uh, that are produced by severe summertime storms, straight line winds are downburst winds. Uh, they can be downburst winds. They can also be rear inflow jet directed down towards the ground, hitting the ground, spreading out um, in a radial type pattern. And then tornadoes, um, looking for a path of damage that is kind of convergent. What, uh, what John likes to say, crisscross applesauce, <laughs> which you see trees or branches crisscrossing in on themselves, um, you, you suspect a tornado in a, a path of damage. But just to physically understand what's happening with straight line winds, oftentimes uh, you're looking at a squall line. Um, the straight line winds result from a combination of the forward motion of the storm. So say you're driving a car, that forward motion, everything moving along at 40 to 50 miles per hour per se, or, or let's, just, let's just imagine that. But at the same time, you've got some higher wind speeds aloft and you've got some sinking air uh, coming into that storm descending down. So in addition to the forward motion of the storm, you've got some higher momentum air that's translating down to the surface. So you're basically adding, say the winds are 70 miles an hour aloft, the uh, the storm is moving 50 miles an hour in one direction, but you've got a rear descending jet. Um, you can end up with 70 plus mile an hour winds uh, or or greater actually, because you're mixing that higher momentum down to the surface. So 50 plus 70, you you never get complete efficient mixing down, but you can end up with some pretty high wind gusts uh, from those situations. And it's really right at the right at the apex, right at the intersection of the rain cooled air, because that's what produces the downward motion um, and a cold pool, the outflow boundary out ahead is essentially the rain cooled air rushing out ahead of the storm. And again, I talked about higher winds aloft and then downdrafts from the cooled air. Um, and you can often <clears throat> then get additively um, wind gusts over 65 miles per hour at the surface. Now, generally what you're looking for in the damage pattern is uh, damage in a single direction, uh, trees parallel to one another. Um, we'd, we often get people disappointed when they haven't had tornadic damage, but straight line winds can be extremely destructive. Um, you get a big um, clump of rain cooled air that hits the ground at 60, 70 miles per hour and then spreads out. That's um, That can produce widespread damage that um, you know, it takes a while to dissipate that much energy over, over a, a small area. Uh, so oftentimes we're looking for straight line winds um, and heavy rain. A lot of times you'll end up with root balls being exposed, especially with evergreen trees. They have really shallow root systems. But these, these kind of trees that are, that are uprooted like that are very synonymous with straight line winds. And we would simply look, look to see uh, in the absence of a concentrated path of damage, we'd, we'd want to kind of verify that they were, they were moving in the same uh, direction parallel to one another. And so if we're looking at a tree stand from a loft, uh, we don't always have the opportunity to see from this vantage point, but this shows a very consistent um, orientation to the damage in the same direction. Now, are there some little tiny branches or parts of trees that may appear to be crossed over? Yes, um, trees never fall perfectly. <laughs> they, may, they may fall kind of in dominoes and one falls on another. And, uh, but in general, we, we can see a, a fading out unidirectional pattern fingerprint from straight line winds. And downburst winds, I mentioned this already, uh, just kind of a big ball of rain cooled air that hits the surface and then spreads out. Um, and we can actually see that on our Doppler radar. We suddenly see like intense inbound winds and outbound winds where 
where the cool air is, has uh, descended and hit the ground. So one part will go that way, one part will go that way, basically spreading out from the surface. And you, know, you get a large enough one of these, winds can exceed 150 miles per hour. Um, that's the equivalent of an EF3 tornado. Um, we don't get many of those in Pennsylvania, but EF1 damage, um, at least criteria damage is very common in straight line winds here in Pennsylvania. That's, you know, around 100, 100 miles per hour. And a downburst, you see a very divergent uh, pattern, um, even more so, the, obviously, the straight lines is things uh, falling down parallel to the wind, but with a downburst, you essentially hit the ground and spread out. And that's that's what's seen in this uh, image. Um, and you may have heard of downburst, microburst, macroburst. They, that just is uh, describing how, how big the damage area is. So microburst is 2.5 miles or less. Macroburst uh, is covering an area more than 2.5 miles. Um, a derecho is really, it's a family of downbursts that um, you, you can build up a thunderstorm, it produces a downburst, throws out an outflow, but conditions are such that you've just created a brand new, uh, a brand new storm out ahead of it with pretty strong uh, forcing with that. And you just create a cycle of, of updrafts and downdrafts that produce damaging wind and they can last um, you know, given the right conditions, they can cross geographical regions from the upper Midwest through the Great Lakes to the Mid-Atlantic. The larger ones uh, do that. This one here was the June 29, 2012 uh, derecho. And again, they're just, uh, it's a fa the family of downbursts is what a derecho is. It's just uh, sustained by the instability and, and uh, cold pools. And it's, it's a perfect combination perfect balancing of the shear, which is wind speed and direction, uh, along with the instability. And a tornado, very specialized wind event, obviously. Um, you need conditions uh, uniquely suited for tornadoes aloft in the storm and close to the ground to, to produce a tornado. Uh, only about one in 10,000 thunderstorms will produce a tornado. And uh, the number that we see every year is on average we have 15 tornadoes per year. Uh, these numbers have slowly increased over the last 20 to 30 years. A lot of that is due to population density, uh, people with cameras, people we just get more reports. Um, uh, some of that maybe I don't want to get into climate change things, but um, in general the numbers are slowly creeping up, and that has to do with the other aspects that I mentioned. But <clears throat> And the other thing is people, they get disappointed when they find out damage is not a tornado. Um, they really shouldn't because a lot of times here in Pennsylvania, the type of damage is very similar to straight line winds versus tornadoes. But tornado is more, oh, what's the word, exciting, I guess. Um, so basically we want you to know the degree of damage does not indicate whether or not there was a tornado. Um, both produce life-threatening conditions and and a lot of property damage. So April of 2019 was a record-breaking month for tornadoes. We did a lot of surveys last year, um, 14. The previous record was 11 in 1991. Um, you can't base global warming uh, into this category as a reasoning factor for that based upon one year, but uh, we're starting to see, at least over the last 25 to 30 years, we, we seem to be seeing earlier severe weather outbreaks um, and that, that may or may not be tied to, to the warming that we've seen. But um, I've issued personally December tornado warnings. Um, I think we just issued one in February. So personally, I've not issued one in January, but um, I believe our office is issued every single month. Here's just a look at the straight line winds uh, again. Looking at very varying aspects of the storm, <clears throat> um, with a well-organized updraft, you end up seeing, uh, and favorable winds aloft, you can end up seeing parts of these uh, storm attributes. An overshooting top, which indicates a really strong updraft came up, an anvil, which is uh, 
ice starting to form uh, in the upper part of the cloud and then spreading up downstream um, in the lower levels, uh, a shelf cloud and cloud-based striations indicating uh, really strong winds at the low levels and, and spinning with height. And then a rear flanking line that's often indicative of, of stronger winds starting to uh, cool and move down from the from the upper levels of the storm. It's often the intersection between the updraft and the rear flanking line that we start to see tornadic development. You have a uh, maximization of shear from that um, and sometimes ingesting boundaries at the surface into that updraft, which can generate uh, enough spin to produce a, a tornado or horizontal convective rolls. John, if you're on, that was his master's uh, work. So essentially, the formation of a uh, shelf cloud is due to uh, sinking air in that part of the storm um, and air from aloft moving rapidly along the ground out ahead of it. So you can see that a lot of times these are really dramatic. Uh, we certainly want to know if you see a shelf cloud coming in because that's that's indicative of of a really good cold pool and um, and a very strong storm and essentially hits the ground and rushes out ahead. Um, so if you've always, if you've wondered why you start to smell that smell of rain um, out ahead of a storm, well out ahead, it looks like it's getting dark, dark, dark. That's the outflow coming from a storm. You, you may actually get a little bit of drizzle and maybe a little bit of light rain with the outflow, but oftentimes an outflow doesn't produce any precipitation. It just has those dark, ominous clouds. And then once that moves through, uh, you start to feel the cooler air and that's, that's rain cooled air from the thunderstorm behind that boundary. And a downburst is essentially uh, just uh, air rapidly coming out from the ground, you have an updraft that can only hold up a certain amount of mass of water. And say that draft suddenly gets cut off or um, you just have so much mass of water that the updraft can't sustain it anymore. So all of a sudden you're accelerating all of that rain cooled air towards the ground, it hits the ground, spreads out. And tornadoes, I mentioned before, the juxtaposition between the updraft uh, of a storm and the flanking line is really the critical part of tornado formation. And it's where a lot of the research is being done, like why certain tornadoes form in in storms and others don't. Um, many have studied the the buoyancy or the the instability of this flanking line um, as as part of the reason why you may be generating tornadoes in that part of the storm or not. But essentially, uh, the nature of a tornado is the air being pulled into and upwards in the storm and uh, the rotation starting to happen from that and which you know that that can be impacted by at the surface if you have a source of like a horizontal circulation a boundary you know say yesterday it rained somewhere and today you know rained somewhere and there was a delineation between where it rained and didn't that believe it or not can be enough of a boundary that uh, you know during the heating of the day produces horizontal convective roll that could be sucked up into a storm. And uh, so once you start to see that evidence of a wall cloud, um, that's when we start considering tornado warnings. We're looking for circulations in storms all the time with our radar. Um, and when the circulation gets narrow enough or constricted enough, that's when we start wanting to issue tornado warnings. So just a look on Doppler radar, um, obviously much different look than straight line or downburst winds. Um, the pattern of damage, as I mentioned before, we're looking for convergence, things crisscrossing, basically a path where winds are being pulled into the center of the tornado to produce that damage. So here you can see, well, here's, here's the radar from here. So Doppler is measuring the degree of winds towards the radar and away. So green colors are moving towards the radar, red is moving away, and that's a cyclonic circulation right in that area. And sure enough, uh, you know, that's what you see hook-wise uh, with a storm. Now, a wall cloud is a lowering, rotating part of a cloud in a thunderstorm. We stress that we, we want to hear about these when you see rotation. Um, like a lot of times these can be mistaken 
uh, when there's lower hanging scud from an outflow or heavier rain. Um, a wall cloud looks impressive, but it's not causing damage yet. It, it's oftentimes a precursor to a tornado coming out of the clouds, but it's not, it by itself is not causing damage. But if you start seeing it rotating, we definitely want to know about that uh, for sure. And actually just the appearance of a wall cloud a lot of times, you know, we'd, we'd rather hear about that than not. And then a funnel cloud, you can have cold air funnels up in the air, but if it doesn't hit the ground, it's not considered a tornado. But obviously rotation is the key. There are some things that can mimic these kinds of clouds. Um, so you want to focus on if you actually see some kind of interaction with the ground, is there, because essentially a funnel takes on the characteristics of the ground that it goes over. So a lot of times if it's if it's dry and dusty, you'll, you'll see a really, uh, um, dramatic funnel, but if it moves over land that's kind of kind of wet, you can you know start to see a little whiteness to it. If you move over ground that's neither dusty nor wet, the funnel can actually disappear for a while. Um, it really depends on where where that funnel is going and if it's hitting the ground or not. But um, if it's not hitting the ground, it means it could soon. So that's what we we want to hear about any funnel that you guys are seeing. And obviously, if you can take pictures, that's that's all the better for us. But we want you to do that safely. And a tornado, rapidly rotating funnel of air in contact with the ground. Um, rotation is the key uh, for all these things. If you look for damage, if there's no damage, there is no tornado. So, so here's just a view uh, in the upper left of an approaching tornado and really what what it can do to structures um, it's not just the wind that produces damage um, essentially whatever becomes airborne due to the strong winds becomes a projectile that can do its own damage and be additively to the winds so instead of just you know 120 mile an hour winds you've got 120 mile an hour projectiles uh, moving towards things in addition to the wind speed so a house can be obliterated um, just depending upon what's what's within the winds um, and what what kind of debris is swirling here's a look inside that wasn't this isn't the house this is a bank i believe but a, a tornado moving um, into this building and you can see nobody is really safe in this room um, once the windows uh, give way Let's see how long that is. So there we go. So everything kind of kind of goes crazy once you've once you've introduced uh, the debris into everything. Um, it, it's kind of like the difference between sandpaper and not. Uh, you're just you're creating more debris, more debris, more things to blow around and and uh, cause more damage. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So we looked at straight line wind fingerprints earlier. Uh, tornadoes have their own fingerprint and it's a convergent path of damage. Um, obviously, some tornadoes are larger than others. We in Pennsylvania are fortunate that we don't see the large, you know, three mile diameter wedge tornadoes that you see in the Midwest uh, or larger, but um, we are looking for a path of damage and we do look for convergent crisscross pattern in that. Now you can actually, a lot of times you'll see the inflow into a, a tornado, um, which appears like straight line winds in this area where I'm I'm uh, moving around the cursor. You know, you get an inflow into a storm that can drop tree stands. A lot of times, uh, you know, the first indication that maybe we we have tornado downstream is, oh gosh, there's an incredible inflow area with with uh, trees flattened. Um, we saw that play out over and over again near the ridges where you get a down downburst over one of the ridges that's feeding into the into the path of the storm and the interaction between that rear flank and the updraft can can cause a tornado so uh, obviously there's a clear crisscross pattern with this and that's what we're looking for uh, especially going across a field where we're extremely lucky when it goes across a field because 
uh, hay, hay stocks and things like that tend to very dramatically um, show footprints, just like you're well, similar to walking in snow. It's it's a footprint of of a tornado when, and you're lucky if you can do that across a farmer's field because um, you, you get some of the most dramatic convergent signatures there. And here's more tornado damage. Again, I think, I'm not sure if I did the survey, but October, 2018, uh, you can see the path through here. Um, I mentioned before that we have to be careful when something looks like a tornado or funnel um, we have to look at it more closely, and I'll ask the question, does, does anybody see strong rotation here or any rotation to this cloud that looks like a funnel on the ground? No rotation, maybe a little bit of upward motion, but that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at first glance, you're like, honey, bring the kids down to the cellar. <laughs> but you look a little more closely, and, and uh, you know, there's little elements kind of traversing the, the cloud deck here, but this was actually not a tornado. Um, Time to grab the camera. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a great picture and it, it's a, it gave, gives us a really good video to show people that sometimes uh, nature is not what, what it seems. Um, so this, this was, obviously there's some sinking air, there's some rain there, uh, but there is no spinning in that column so it, it is not a tornado we might issue a special weather statement there might be some some gusty winds coming out of it but it's certainly not a tornado warning and here's just kind of a climatology um a total total tornadoes by county through 2015. Um, not really a climatology but total throughout the years two areas that are are the the real winners are adjacent to Tornado Alley into Western PA, and then the Southeast Piedmont, which has its own climate zone, is really warm and humid. It gets gets some really good contribution from the the uh, Delaware River, the Chesapeake Bay, really high dew point air, which which accentuates updrafts. Um, and then here in the Central Mountains, uh, we tend to get the smaller ones, but the spin ups on terrain can be can be quite frequent. And we we've seen that over the years, where um, you know a strong downburst rear flank over the ridges can produce a tornado in the valley. <clears throat> so what you should report after looking at all this? Well, we want to know 58 miles per hour or greater. Um, we want to know sub severe thunderstorm winds, um, winds that are over 40. Could be indicative. Of Oh, sorry. I just would you be able to mute your your microphones? I'm picking up somebody's um, dishwashing. I think. <laughs> We're salty. Yeah. So 40 40 miles per hour greater is really a good uh, separation point because 40 miles an hour starts to generate small branches, things like that, could be indicative of storm strengthening into something that might be severe. And then any type of damage produced by thunderstorm, large limbs down, roof damage, extent of the damage. Um, is it just a few trees or hundreds? Um, it generally takes more than one tree down to verify a severe, but if you see more than one tree down, um, and if they're snapped or uprooted, we definitely want to know that. And tornado activity. When we're at the office uh, looking at a rotating storm, we want to know if you're seeing a wall cloud. We want to know if you're seeing rotation. Um, we want to see if a cloud looks like a funnel. Yes, we want to know. But especially if you're seeing rotation, we, we hope you're able to call us right away. And then if there's a tornado, is it producing damage? Is the funnel that you can see from your vantage point hitting the ground or it's, it's too far in the distance, maybe beyond the horizon, you just can't tell. Uh, and then any other information you have where it's moving, or any injuries or deaths in addition to, to damage. Hail, any size is important to us. Um, it's severe if it is one inch diameter or greater, which is quarter sized or greater. Um, now here we, we say, please don't report marble sized hail because marbles are any size. <laughs> and we'll always say, well, what size marble? Um, and then I always tell this, this story, uh, because it's funny, 
um, when I was at in Boise, um, we had a an answering machine that our spotters would call, and we we could listen to it as we were working. So we could choose to either pick up and ask them more questions, or just hear their report. And so this guy in eastern Malheur County, Oregon, eastern Oregon, calls up and says, "We have hail the size of thumbs or larger." <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just cracked us up because I mean thumbs are any size as well. So um, if you're reporting hail, we just want to know how big it is. Um, even if uh, you don't use our terminology, just let us know what size. But oftentimes coin sizes are good. Uh, we may ask you, are there any quarter size ones in there? Because oftentimes to ver well not oftentimes, but to verify severe hailstorm, we want to know the size of the largest hailstone. So you may hear the forecaster say, well, did you have any quarters in there? And now you know why, because we have to verify the largest hailstone. Here is a fantastic view of how localized a hail core can be. Well, wow. in the storm, it's only a small portion of the storm that is producing a heavy rain shaft, or in this case, a hail shaft. Um, and if the storm is moving in this direction, you, know, you can get a, a nice stripe. It looks like you know, snow, but this is this is less than a mile wide, uh, it appears there. Several, maybe several miles long, but less than a mile wide. And here, getting closer, just take a look. I mean, these guys here got pummeled and their, their neighbors at the next farm over, maybe only, maybe they didn't see any, but here it's, it's almost plowable. So that's just the fickle nature of, of these storms and really, you know, half mile can make a huge difference, which accentuates why why we're doing this, why we need you, um, because what what's happening at the ground and where and when is critical for our awareness and our ability to warn further on downstream. Flooding, um, Pennsylvania, flooding is is really uh, not to downplay the other hazards, but um, we have such a complex uh, hydrologic system with creeks, streams, rivers, um, with ridges and valleys that flooding is really, really becomes the number one concern in, in the summertime with storms. You can build up severe storms, get wind, but a lot of times those storms collapse and turn into heavy rain producers that, that produce flooding. So our focus on flooding is synonymous with every uh, severe event. If you've got a big updraft to produce severe weather, you've, you've got a big updraft to produce heavy rain. Um, so the forecasts for river flooding are handled by the River Forecast Center. Um, they're, they're looking at specific gauge locations along the main stem and, and verifying those. Um, those larger main stem rivers take, you know, on the order of six hours to respond to heavy rain. So you'll see a, a slug of rain come down in six hours for those larger waterways but for the smaller ones many of them are very flashy and they can flood on the order of uh you know some less than an hour but one to two hours um and so when we when we're going to be issuing flash flood warnings we're really concerned about small streams and creeks um aerial warnings and river flood warnings are, are different than those uh, but Essentially, the river forecast for those main stem rivers are determined by forecast rainfall, soil conditions in the wintertime, how cold is it, um, is precip coming down as snow, and it's really just not going to add to the water uh, in, that, in that particular drainage basin. Time of year, foliage plays a big, big uh, impact. The routing of upstream water, um, you know, we have a number of dams that, you know, they release, and they're, they're trying to make room for enough seasonal water to be stored in there so they don't get get overrun but sometimes in the course of trying to drain those you have rain that combines with it and if they don't decrease their flow from the dam you can flood downstream locations so their forecasts are used for dam operators to make sure that they're not releasing too much and uh you know the real dangerous uh flooding is flash flooding that can occur very quickly um, especially if you're near streams it can be hazardous um, very hazardous you need to to be aware of where the higher ground is and and be able to get away in, in a short period of time streams and creeks can respond in minutes 
two hours after a heavy rain event and and certain certain streams are more flashy than others uh, certain setups are more flashy than others too if you have homogeneous uh, soil that's essentially saturated and then you come along and have uh, heavy rain from a thunderstorm dropping two to three inch per eight per per hour rates um, you're just going to exacerbate the the uh, runoff from that so anything that falls is is going to be runoff um, and flash flooding occurs when that happens so slower rises in streams and creeks um, they can be more nuisance and we issue flood advisories for those in fact we in the office we call them puddle advisories um, we still would rather not see people drive through like that because suddenly you know somebody uh, goes in their their uh you know say they they lose power in their car suddenly you're looking at quote unquote a water rescue which starts to look like flash flooding and, and life hazardous threat to life and property when really they just they drove into an area and uh you know they have a stalled alternator or something but we always stress do not drive into areas where the water covers the road because you you don't know what's going on underneath here you may think you do, but you don't. Um, and <clears throat> slower rises on streams and creeks are more of a threat to property than life, un un at least until somebody drives into it. So essentially what we want you to report is any water that covers the road, um, closed roads, underpasses, um, flooded homes, businesses, uh, basements. We, we need to know when those things start to happen. Uh, if in your area you see a river, stream, creek out of your banks, uh, clogged storm drains that occurs with heavy rain in the fall, especially, or an ice jam can also be indicative of flash flooding. And things, you know, last year, well, two years ago it was, um, some of the most effective spotter reports are when people say the water is higher than I have ever seen it. And I've lived here 25, 30 years. If you want to see a forecaster jump to action and issue warnings, just say that during a heavy rain event um, and, and don't make it up. <laughs> we want it to be accurate. But that kind of qualitative information really helps us know that this is something unusual and what we're seeing on radar is being verified by your words and report. And what we need to know is when did the flooding begin? What's the water depth? Um, we don't expect you to get out in, in the middle of it and measure. Please don't. Um, we're not giving you boogie boards and body suits to do that. We want you to stay safe. Um, are there any stranded cars or people? Is it just a nuisance type intersection thing where somebody drove into it and they stalled out? Or is this really the water's moving fast and life-threatening condition? We want to know all those things to the degree that you're aware of. And you know, essentially, flooding of a farm field or or the usual road that goes underwater um, is not necessarily a warning. It's it's generally a nuisance. It's an advisory type event because we we are aware of all those places, the typical suspects. Um, we don't want people driving into them, but they're not necessarily life threatening. Um, things beyond that scope are warning events. And what becomes really helpful for us is if if you do have a rain gauge, you got a home home weather uh, station. We try to look at these, but we can't see them all the time. But heavy rainfall rates, say if you're looking at it in 15 minutes and you've accumulated an inch and a half already, and your rain your weather station says the rainfall rate is seven inches per hour. We want to know about that. Um, we also want to know just in general, if you've had over an inch, two inches, three inches, and what how how long it's been how long it took to fall that period of time. And then when a storm is over, we compile reports uh, of, of amounts. And again, for the larger scale ones, one inch or more is generally the cutoff. So if you've received an inch from a storm, that's significant to us. And we wanna put it in our, in our public information statements. So this, this is exactly what we don't want people to do. And this was a newspaper reporter live on air, and this guy tried to he 
try to drive through that that area of water. And pardon the language, but I think the thing that people don't really realize when they do that is not only they're putting themselves in jeopardy first and foremost, but you are putting first responders at risk. You're putting this TV reporter at risk because he's there just reporting the conditions, and now he has to decide whether or not to jump in and help. Is is, is he trained to do that? So. So he's just shocked and dazed at this point. He didn't know whether to stay with his car or not. He's he's worried about his car. And actually he's lucky that there isn't a whole lot of current out there uh, because cars can really just be washed away. You don't know the integrity of the road underneath at that yeah, point. So that that's why we don't want people to do that. And he was actually quite lucky because there was no real current driving him downstream. But turn around, don't drown. That's why we say it. So winter weather. Uh, although you know we're almost into summer and we have most of our training courses at this time of year, winter weather is very important part of the Skyworm program, and we're always looking for reports, uh, snow totals, um, and and there is a way to do it the right way. Um, but before I get into that, you know, our criteria for, for wintertime warning criteria, there's a 12 hour and a 24 hour. Uh, the 12 hour is either four or sorry, five or six inches in 12 hours. Uh, the 24 hour is seven or eight inches in 24 hours to qualify as heavy snow warning criteria. And then the advisory criteria is also 12 or 24, or, or sorry, no, it's, a, it's just 12 hours. Um, we expect two to three inches, a midpoint of two and a half inches in that 12 hour period. Um, anything less than a midpoint of three um, is not garnering an advisory. Anything less than a midpoint of five in those places is not garnering a warning, it's an advisory. So snow measurement is not exact science when you have wind involved, if you've uh, got trees, um, you have to be aware of the location as well because when you start getting into the the properties thermodynamically of certain objects. Um, you may end up with half the storm melting on the pavement, but on the grass, you've got, uh, you know, a significant amount. So it, it's really important to different, differentiate also between rates and snow accumulation, because <clears throat> high rates can end up producing large accumulations, like it's snowing at the rate of an inch an hour. Uh, this time of year in April, we're, we actually have a couple possibilities for snow this week. Accumulations in April are highly dependent upon snowfall rates. Why? Because the ground tends to be warmer and you need to overcome that warmth to essentially uh, start piling up snow. Otherwise, it's just going to melt as it falls. So accumulations are how much snow fell from a storm. Rates are how much is occurring in an hour. And essentially to do snow measurement right uh, requires a snowboard, preferably painted white. Uh, again, having a high albedo, which is reflectivity, means that white board is not going to warm up from the sun as, as quickly as, as uh, say, asphalt will. If you want to get a ruler, uh, fancy, it helps to have it divided into tenths. You don't have to. I don't have one at home like that. I just estimate. And then a flag in the snow, because when it gets deep, uh, you may not be able to find a white board in the snow. Duh. <laughs> So the official method is to find a location representative before the storm 
not near a building where things can be drifting, not near trees or bushes, which may shelter the board. Um, and you might want to have two or three locations so that you can just average them. That's usually the best way to do it. And then placing your snowboard and flag, don't just measure in the grass uh, because the ruler is going to press into the grass below and inflate measurements. You really want to have a whiteboard to lessen the melting uh, for the reason I mentioned before. And then step number three, this is really important. Every six hours is when you measure it. Uh, more frequent measurements doesn't allow for settling and inflates the totals. Um, and that that can be important over a season of time. Suddenly, say you've blown away the climate record because you, you measured snow incorrectly. Um, but generally speaking, for, for you guys, since you're not doing it every day, um, you know, if you can measure once every six hours for, for a larger storm, uh, you probably don't have to worry about this too much because most of our most of our storm events are six to 12 hours in duration or less. Um, and then at the end, you need you want to repeat until the storm is finished. Um, add your six hourly measurements together and that's your storm total snowfall. But by the end of a storm, the the actual accumulation will have settled. So we we're, we're interested in both of those amounts. And again, depth just reinforces that, that the snow on the ground is not a sum of the six hour measurements, and it's because of compaction and it's because of melting. Um, that's why we, we say we need you to measure on a flat, hard surface, preferably white. Um, and yeah, so enough about that. So here's, here is an awesome video from one of the weather service employees up in Binghamton from a huge storm back in March 2017. Time lapses are cool, but well over 20 inches from that storm for them. And I'll just let it run again because it's fun. But seeing that the branches get weighted down and uh, his Mr. Bill get covered up, it's fun. So uh, sleet and freezing rain, uh, we, we also want to know that too. Uh, sleet is balls of ice that bounce when they fall. Um, partially melted uh, hydrometeors, raindrops, um, or sorry, partially refrozen. They can be snowflakes that have come down, melted partially, and then refroze, rhymed ice onto them. Freezing rain is is can be snowflakes or rain that comes down and then hits the ground, freezes on contact, super cool droplets. And we want you to measure the accumulation of ice, generally in tenths of an inch. Um, a lot of times people will tell how much rain fell during a period of time. If it fell all this freezing rain, it's not all going to accrete on those surfaces. So that's why we want you to estimate or measure, if you can, how, how thick the depth of ice is on, on an object. And here's the criteria for ice storm warnings quarter inch over the southern half of Pennsylvania and a half inch across the north where apparently they're more hardy than the rest of us. <laughs> so when when and what should you report snowfall during the storm? We will never be unhappy if you call us with a report during a storm and if you call frequently every couple of hours if you're getting one inch per hour rates we want to know. Um, but every three or six hours is very helpful because we want to send out statements, letting people know what's fallen. It also helps us update our forecast to know what part of the storm is still to come. So we want snow depth total on the ground and then how much you've measured over that period of time, uh, nearest to a tenth of an inch if you can, and report as soon as the storm ends to give us your total. And anytime there are rates of an inch or more per hour, uh, that's generally a quarter mile or less, we want to hear from you because conditions deteriorate rapidly in those situations. Fleet, we want to know when there's a changeover. Um, there's a great um, app that, that you can uh, do this on in addition to letting us know. It's called PING. Um, it's precipitation. I forget what the acronym stands for, but especially this winter, every single storm we had was snow to sleet to freezing rain to rain. And we we can tell looking at radar when when there's a changeover happening, but again, to know at the surface from you when you've changed over really helps us. It helps us do better for the next people that are downstream. 
Um, it helps to see if we've been too bullish on the snow. It helps to see if our models have underdone the degree of warming or, or overdone the, the amount of cooling that we, we were expecting. Freezing rain, any occurrence garners an advisory. So if you have any amount of freezing rain, we wanna know. Um, it's tougher on sidewalks and driveways to, to measure that, but branches is easiest. And divide by two if measuring total ice accumulation on a branch, because it's, it's on both sides. As far as reporting, um, the reporting guideline sheet that was included, uh, the attachments uh, to this virtually, that's calling us is, is the quickest way. And we can also ask you follow-up questions. Social media is also fantastic for us. Um, we're not staffed to answer the phone nonstop. Uh, so oftentimes we'll be completing a task, uh, doing an interview, and then then we'll take a look and see what reports uh, we've solicited and gotten from you guys. We can either get those by Facebook. We'll send out a request for reports uh, via social media, either Twitter or Facebook, and um, you can always respond to those and let us know. And oops, always remember to include your location and time because we need to know when that when when it was measured. Uh, what period of time it fell and the time and that is gold to us to know that information uh, the website there's a way but if the report is urgent please call us uh, amateur radio we do have amateur radio during severe weather um, and if if you are an amateur radio operator you probably already know how to do that um, on the severe weather days but uh, most of you will probably be using the other methods and then email, if you've taken a bunch of pictures, you think maybe there was some rotation, there's there's evidence of a track, um, convergent pattern. Um, oftentimes our first indication that maybe something was tornadic are your pictures. And uh, you can send us larger ones uh, by, you know, to the ctp.stormreports at noaa.gov. And let us know if you sent something because we may we may not see it right away. You could maybe say, hey, I sent you uh, some pictures and CTP storm reports, um, but you just let us know by Facebook because oftentimes we're still busy at that point, but uh, we will eventually get to compiling those reports and sending them out. And as I mentioned, uh, John wanted me to remind you that an email will be coming tonight or he said tomorrow morning for you to register. And it's probably it, it's less painless than sitting through listening to me talk about this stuff. <laughs> um, but if you're still excited, we, we really want to have you. Again, um, can't stress enough how important the ground truth is to basically any weather situation. Um, we've gotten pretty good at correlating uh, different parameters at different levels of the atmosphere and know what to expect. But as far as what's happening in any individual location, um, it comes down to you guys. It comes down to having those ground truth reports and having knowing that you can trust those measurements and and what you know you're telling us is so valuable to us. So I really, really hope as many of you who still want to will sign up and become spotters for us. So you should look for an email tomorrow with a form to fill out. It could come tonight. If you're already a spotter, fill out a new form. We could get you a new card. Um, check check the box at the top. Your email address is really important. We can send out our newsletter to you virtually. Um, it's a digital, it used to be printed out, but, and also we can keep in contact with you if you move. So definitely give us your email address if you're comfortable doing that. Phone number, um, if, if you're comfortable again doing that, we, we don't share phone numbers, but it would be helpful for us to be able to contact you after an event uh, for trying to solicit uh, damage reports. And um, I've never personally been associated with this, but with a big event, maybe the media may want to interview somebody. Uh, you know, if you have an eyewitness account of a big storm, um, you know, certainly we would provide that information and um, uh, we would ask your permission first uh, to, to volunteer your information if, if they want to talk to you personally. And so this is the way you can contact us, uh, any number of ways, phone, uh, internet, web reporting, um, Facebook, Twitter, email, um, just hit us up. We're here 24-7. And let's see.
these are some of the amateur uh, ham radio repeaters and frequencies used for Skywarn if, if you're a ham radio operator and want to know that. And a few final thoughts. I mentioned this at the beginning, but the reporting criteria sheet, uh, print that out and keep it next to your phone. Um, you may, after this, I kind of rambled and covered a lot of things. You may be unclear as to what we want you to exactly report to us. Just print that out right now um, or right after we finish here and, and keep it somewhere handy so you know what, what we want to uh, what we hope to receive from you information wise. Spotter cards, once you register, will be emailed to you. And you don't need a spotter number to report to our office. Uh, so, you know, we, <clears throat> we a lot of time will kind of crowdsource reports. Uh, we do have some reports that riot, raise some eyebrows, and uh, we've learned to be a little question of, of some reports because they tend to be like the, the greatest snow reports of any event, uh, which means there's a glacier in somebody's backyard come May. Um, but overall, people are pretty pretty good with their their reports. But you don't you don't need to be to have a spotter number to report to our office. You could you could uh, report the snow amounts this week to us, um, even though you haven't gotten uh, a spotter card yet. So all information is strictly kept internal and confidential. It is only to improve our service. Um, if we use the information in a statement, it'll say a spotter at you know three miles west of whatever. We'll never use your name. We'll never give that out to anybody. And any questions? I guess I, yeah, that was about, about as long as I expected it to be. Any questions for anybody? I don't, I'm gonna check to see if you submitted any. Um, let's see. Not everybody at once. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Fire. Um, for the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, how do we go about getting them credit for their badges? So are they are some people watching this and getting credit for for like weather badge? That I don't know. But I did forward the links to all our all our scouts here at Susquehanna Council. Okay. Um, we use merit badge counselors, and only a couple are are uh, authorized counselors mm -hmm. for for weather. Okay. So, well, I would say. Since that's a little, it's just a little outside the scope of this. I, I think sitting through this course would certainly contribute to a weather merit badge. But I, again, I don't know the specific requirements there. But um, you could either email us at ctp.stormreports, and we can, or or call that number to to get that information. I'm not in the office right now, obviously. Yeah, I don't right. have Fenway Park and Beaver Stadium in the office. This is my basement. Right. Um, but yeah, if you want to fire away something like that, somebody at the office can help you. Generally, um, if you really you just need to have pr you just need to have proof that somebody somebody actually took the course, then you you probably want to register and get your get your spotter card. Right. Okay. That would probably be the best way. Um, Last thing is the last requirement the boys have on their merit badge is to build a device that can measure some type of weather. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you could you could have them build a snowboard. <laughs> that might be right. a quick way to do it. Um, offhand, I mean, I guess there are ways to make homemade rain gauges or anemometers but that's not right. something that i'm i'm not an expert at that but um i would think like a snowboard that's really that's white material white maybe out of pvc or plastic or something um right with a flag it, that that could be that could be a project i think okay okay thank you sure so i've I, been Interesting question. 
Sure. Hi, Charles. I go to school in the Williamsport area, and I'm a firefighter up there. And that's okay. where I got registered for this course. Yeah. My permanent residence is in Bucks County. Okay. Am I able to do both? Oh, absolutely. In yeah. State College and not to worry about oh, transferring yeah. every time I move? No, no, there's there's no transfer. It's just like um, we would probably know from your contact information. Um, and you're given a spotter number that that proves you have done the course and everything. But no, you don't. Um, so I would then just contact Mount Holly instead of staying college. Uh, hmm. Not necessarily. It depends on the frequency of reports. Like if you if you are reporting a lot from Mount Holly, but you're a, st a state college weather spotter, it would benefit you to know what the Mount Holly Philadelphia number is, just so we don't have to keep going in a circle. Oh, and yeah, I would know. definitely get in contact with the right one depending on where oh, I am. Yeah. Oh yeah, but no, you don't have to. You you're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure with that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we'd we'd love to have you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got one question. I'm a firefighter out of Montgomery County. Is okay. there uh, going to be a repeater for Montgomery County and Bucks area, or is that in the near future, like the radio repeater? That I do not know. Oh, okay. um, you mean kind of like some of the PennDOT repeaters that? Well, that that, some... that uh, the repeater list you gave us, there's not one yeah. listed for oh, Montgomery oh, yeah. Bucks. I, yeah, I do not know that. Um, you might, if you could email our CTP storm reports, uh, somebody can dig into that at the office. Okay. Um, that's what I would suggest, and then we can and look into it. But so I would probably report to Mount Holly, right? Yes, Montgomery. Yeah, you would. You would definitely report to Mount Holly. All right. Thank you. Yep. On the repeater question, mm -hmm. if you contact your local amateur radio club, they can tell you what repeaters are being used for storm reports. Yeah, I figured that, but you know, I'm, I'm actually getting my license really soon. As soon as this stuff gets done, I'm gonna go get my license. Yeah, get get a hold of your local club and, and ask them those questions. They'll know more about it. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, thanks for that. I do have a quick question, kind of a two-part question for the MPing app. Yeah. Uh, I'm a chaser out of Eastern Lycoming County and have been using MPing for a couple of years now and seen it a lot more uh, or uh, people use it a little bit more throughout the season for different things from snow to severe weather. Is yeah. that something uh, since being on the road occasionally during these types of events and it's a little bit more difficult to send a tweet or even a uh, Facebook messenger message for a report, is the MPing probably the preferred method? Uh, for you guys to to see that, um, especially during the winter time, I'd say yes. Um, summertime, um, if you can, social media or a phone call gives us that that immediate, like, sure. you know, because you know a report coming from the general public versus a storm spotter, the storm spotter holds more weight. Sure. Um, so, but we we have M ping. It's you know we're monitoring that. All the time it's just we tend to get more reports from the social media and mm -hmm. we do love we do love hearing directly from you so we can ask you more questions too gotcha uh, i typically will call but... yeah uh, i would say if mping is is uh is all you can do time wise we'd love it and gotcha we, you know it'd be very valuable um so yeah only do do what you can do and if if you can do mping that's awesome if if you can do more you know, we're, we're happy with that too. Okay. And the yeah. second part with that question, I'm sure you're aware of it. And those of us who have been monitoring, especially on radar scope, we see that pop up. Uh, somebody constantly reports golf ball size hail and uh, larger hail down near the Gettysburg area. Is that something yeah. with your resources you've been able to try to weed that out or because it's a public based system, you, there's not much you can do about it? uh yeah the latter there's, there's not a whole lot we can do uh, about it like we we know internally that it's it's happening and yeah. we won't but um if it's 
Yeah, if it's happening on Mping, we can't do anything about that because that's their that's the private app. Mm -hmm. It is Mping is really helpful to us, but um, I would say you know we know which ones are real and which aren't if we have that that certain observer. And I was thinking of him as I was mentioning that that a certain <laughs> observer is sure. always giving us you know. So we will not put those reports in an LSR if there's okay. not really. Yeah, if there's not truth around it to substantiate it, we're we're pretty. It doesn't take us long to catch on when somebody's doing that, you know. Mm -hmm. But for if it's a private app like Mping, we we really can't do anything about it. Sure, sure. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sure, sure. Anybody else? Well, right. thank you for spending some time with me. I'll I'll. Keep it keep it open if you have any other questions. And watch definitely watch for that email. Oh, Larry, did you have a question? No, I just want to thank you for your time putting this on. Absolutely, it's our pleasure. Thanks for thanks for spending some time with us tonight. If we already have a spotter number, that does not change, correct? Um. Uh, that I don't know. Do you have a spotter number from another location? No, I've had the same one through State College for oh, yeah. probably 20 years. So I just wanted okay. to make sure. Yeah, I, I recognize the name. Um no, it won't it won't change. Um but it it's good to it's good for us to know to get an update if you've moved or or just to know that the current information is current. Um not not to make light of it but sometimes when we try to call people um sometimes we find out that somebody has passed away or okay. or they don't live there anymore um sure. we it's it's not fun to deal with that but um so any any update we get from you is is welcome so if you want to register feel free to say your existing spotter okay yeah thank, thank you, you. All right, anybody else? Calling once, twice, three times. I guess we will we will end unless you, you have one more question. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we look forward to interacting with you and receiving your reports. And uh, look for that email either tonight or tomorrow. Uh, John Bangoff will be sending that out. And thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.